The uh, troopy was collected by its new owner 10 minutes ago. I'm contemplating <coughs> what arrives here in uh, about four days time. It's another build and it's, be, it's difficult for me to let go of these cars because I, I pour my heart and soul out into them. I'm Andrew St. Pierre White, explorer, overlander and broadcaster with over 40 years driving 4x4s in association with the Overland Workshop. In August 2023, I did something impulsive. I ordered a 2.8 auto Land Cruiser Troop Carrier. I'm now going to start my journey to find out if that was a good idea. And like all smart husbands, I will first ask the opinion of my wife. So another day, another troopie. Actually, maybe this is not a good idea. Oh my word, you know what it looks like? Do you remember the, that movie about the co cars? The truck in cars? That looks like the front of the truck in cars. That beat up old truck. Okay, now, now I better have another look at it, a proper look. No, I'm still seeing cars. I can't unsee it. Yep, bad idea. It's the lights. It also looks wider. The bonnet looks much wider. Am I imagining things that it's a bit... I'm getting the impression of a hum... You know, if I can get rid of the car's impression down here. It's a bit hummerish because it's so wide. It or looks wider it? because it's angled. Whereas before it was lumpy down to here, this is now vertical. That's why it looks wider. No wider, it's exactly the same, it just looks wider. And another thing I don't like about the design, this hideous, enormous indicator. Surely, well, it is what it is. Let's face it, subtlety wasn't the brief in the design on this vehicle. I do like the colour. I think it's called French Vanilla. I, w I would have it in this colour. That lovely new car smell. But that's the most cliched thing in the world to say when you get into a new car. Right, so it's an automatic. That's pretty cool. This is from the 1970s and I believe this is about 2008. So yeah, it's going to have a big facelift. It's going to have a 4X Overland facelift and it's going to be stunning. I have so much confidence in your ability to take an ugly duckling and to just make it into the most magnificent swan. After all, look what you did with me. my first impression so uh, it's much quieter than the V8 immediately I've only just started it but it's obviously quieter than the V8 with the engine on okay so the radio is turning itself off if I hold that down it will feel strange even the V8 is a is, 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 is not a modern vehicle this has got all these different electronics in it to aid safety and this automatic gearbox which feels very strange <laughs> I'm actually suddenly excited about the car and I looked at it and I thought to myself oh that's an ugly duckling but I, 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 I'm driving an automatic troop carrier and the first from me uh, do I like it it's quieter definitely quieter uh, gear change first to second was not particularly smooth uh, into third uh, oh, interesting. Brakes are good. So the first thing I'm going to do now is uh, weigh it. I need to know exactly where I am in terms of how much this thing weighs because there are some significant weight advantages over the V8 with the 2.8. What are they? 2398 kilograms total weight. Front axle 1,184, rear axle 1,214. The weight of my V8 was 2,456 kilograms. The weight of this is 2,398. This is 58 kilograms lighter. 
my VH, the GVM, was 3330 kilograms. GVM on this was increased, actually not with this model, about a year ago. There was a GVM increase on the previous model, but it applies now at 3510. That gives me, giving me an extra 180 usable kilograms. That totals 238 more kilograms that I can pack into this thing without having to do a GVM upgrade. And on my Gray Troop Carrier, I managed to build that entire vehicle without doing a GVM upgrade. And I worked out that when I was full of water, Gwen and I, full of fuel, full of all our parts, weeks worth of food, we were at about 3,330 kilograms. We were on GVM, but we weren't beyond GVM, which means we didn't need a GVM upgrade. So now, uh, not only do I not need a GVM upgrade with what I'm going to do with this, I definitely don't need one. The gearbox is very unrefined. Given that I've just climbed out of an Ineos Grenadier that has the BMW style change in the gearbox, which is very refined and very, very clean in the hands, this is very agricultural in the hands. There's nothing subtle about this. Let's take it for a drive. I'm going to start my build right now. And I'm going to do that by going to my favorite electrical parts and accessory wholesaler, Perth Pro. As I do that, I'm going to talk about the driving on road of this, of this car. I have so much experience with the V8 that I feel that uh, but it's been laden and I'm now in a car that is empty I so I'm not going to talk too much about the actual feel and performance of the engine until I understand a little bit more about it from the driver's seat though I have to say right now that visibility is restricted when compared to the V8 the big square bonnet in front of me has a, there's a big blind spot and I can see it immediately and that is particularly in front of me on the left hand side the big square bonnet if I'm driving off road I'm not gonna see anything on that corner even parking that 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 is I'll get used to it but visibility is not as good as the V8 out the front windscreen it's not uh, the mirrors, these are electric mirrors, get into traffic before I fiddle with that because they both need a little bit of an adjustment. And in front of me I have deal, the dials and instruments and everything, uh, two separate fuel tanks uh, for back and front. Generally speaking I drive with the, with the sub tank at about 20 litres and then I just use the front tank. When I'm on a trip, I'll always drain the sump tank first because of uh, waste distribution. Uh, and I'm going to do exactly the same now because even though the car is empty, the back is still heavier than the front. So I'm going to use up my, my uh, sub tank. I, uh, this car has two 90 litre tanks, separate fillers, separate gauges. Toyota is a funny organization. They, because, well, I, I speak specifically about the team that designs, develops the 70 series. Up to this point, the electric antenna fitted to 70 series was the same one fitted in probably 1980s vintage. They, they, they've decided that an antenna from 1967 is going to be a better option. No longer an electric antenna. I don't listen to the radio much. Now I'm not going to listen to it at all. It's interesting that at, at 1500 RPM there is a vibration from the engine that, that can you hear it? That you know and I'm applying a little bit of power and it almost feels as if it wants to change down. So can you feel it? There you go. That, it's kind of going it's not a particularly satisfying oh I'm going too fast for the speed limit a little dash thing in the dashboard's come gone red I'll slow down a little bit it's warning me that I'm going a little fast for the speed limit and let me get back down to 60 
uh, it's not very bright there you go it's come off it's, it's, a, it's a red light but it's very dull not not bright at all so it's not going to be that effective actually it has lane assist which I'm going to turn off I have turned it off I don't want lane, lane change assist I don't want it okay I'm a little bit disappointed in the quality. I mean, there's a there's a gap between the raised air intake and the body, large enough for a small tree to fit in there. And of course, as it jams in there, it's just going to damage the bodywork. And that's very 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 shoddy. There's this big gap here with very very thin connections. It's, it's that that's that's not Toyota like and of course as soon as you open the bonnet you will see the water charged intercooler intercooled turbocharged diesel engines have an intercooler to reduce the temperature of the charge air because the colder the air the more dense it is and the more efficiently it burns in the combustion chamber that's the reason for an intercooler. There are two ways of cooling that air. One is a large radiator where ram air is forced through it to cool it. And the other way, the more efficient way, is that you get air to pass through a traditional water radiator and that cools the charge air. And that's what the new 2.8 has in this vehicle. And if you look closely down here, you'll see a radiator. Now behind that radiator is another radiator. Can you see it there? And it actually travels all the way along to that side. It's quite large. And that there is the expansion tank for the main vehicle engine cooling radiator and that is the expansion tank for the water-cooled intercooler. Somehow it feels a little bit more refined than my usual troop carrier. It must be just that lack of vibration from the engine, because even the six cylinder, there's a lot of vibration from the engine. Here there's not that much, much less. Although, more on idle. Hmm. Can you hear that? That's kind of vibration or something. It's a very, very hot day today. No easy fix for a second battery, but if uh, one would put in a, a heavy duty larger airbox, plenty of space for that. And I imagine this engine far easier to work on than the V8. V8, very little space around it. The distance between the grill and the radiator fan, probably double that of the V8. So while there's a lot more space in the engine bay, there's not a lot more space to do stuff. It just makes it easier to work on. A bit of turbo lag. I can feel it already. There is turbo lag on the immediate pull away. It's not bad, but it's there. On the V8, you have very little turbo lag on the V8. Honestly, it's hardly noticeable. It is noticeable on this four-cylinder. There is a satisfaction in the V8 with the noise it makes, with the startup. This feels like a Hilux. It feels like a van. It's the same engine they put in the in the Hi Ace. It, 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 it's nothing special about it. You could say that about the 1HZ, the straight six, but that is. Uh, I'm going to have to sort that out. It keeps turning on the radio and I turn off the radio and I make the volume zero and that insists on turning the radio on every time I get in the car. Um, you, you have a mental association with the with the 1HZ I have with the troop carrier in that it is uh, it's very satisfying, that engine. It, it, there's nothing like it. It's just this, this really, really, I mean, it's as underpowered as they come, but you know, it's just this beautifully it's a reliable power plant that is going to 
get you there and get you home again. The V8 has a similar feel guys that you get in it and you just something about the V8 is just <clears throat> that's not happening with this four cylinder. It feels like I'm driving a van. Cars are not just about what they are. Car enthusiasts, cars are about how they make you feel. And this is not fiddling me full of excitement right now. All right, there's nothing wrong with the way it accelerates. If I had a V8 next to me, a standard V8 next to me, it wouldn't be faster than that. It would be just very similar. While the vast majority of the electrical components in the new build will come from Perth Pro, I'm just now starting out. I need to get the vehicle operational in terms of, I've got a little fridge on its way uh, for armrest fridge. Um, I've All right, an update on my report. It is two weeks later. I have 400 and 40 kilometers on the clock. I took it out to Northern, a uh, little excursion, two hours there, two hours back. And I am getting used to two things. Firstly, uh, the automatic gearbox and everything, the car is just generally a little bit more refined than the, with the V8. The, tra uh, uh, the transmission of vibrations through the cab is less than with the V8. It's part of the fact that it is quieter. I have now fitted some sound insulation, so it's even quieter. And the automatic gearbox makes it kind of easier to drive. For lazy people, this is a good thing. For me, it's a bit of a, it's a good thing as well, because I also use my Troopy as my daily driver. I don't commute, so I, I don't get stuck in traffic that often with it, but I do use it around town and it's easier to drive because it's an automatic. I am enjoying driving it and I, I, I tell you something, this is as responsive as the V8 in its standard form, easily as responsive. It pulls away sharply, it accelerates on hills, it, is, it, it gets past trucks easily. Yes, I'm not loaded, that is true and definitely an important part of this. The other part that I'm getting used to, which I'm very pleased about, is I'm getting used to the way it looks. And I do believe that I can make this look stunning. I need to get rid of that hideous bumper and I have left it in the hands of, well in my mind anyway, the guys at Off-Road Animal. They did such a good bar on my last troop carrier, my last V8. That bar to me was just beautiful. It was a work of art. I was at my local dealership and the salesperson rather proudly showed me the new bull bar that I had already actually seen on their press pictures for the new 70 series. And I was, I went, um, uh, what I meant was, oh, God, it's terrible. Because a Toyota, when, when they, they, this is obvious, when they decide we need a bull bar, so what do we do? We go to the engineers. And what do engineers do? They go, well, we're engineers and everything has to be perfect for our engineering requirements and all of that kind of stuff. And they know nothing about art. So that's the error. Taking it to the engineers is the last thing you do. It's not that you don't do it. It's that you do it right at the end. You give it to artists to do and then you send it to the engineering department right at the end and the engineering department will say, well, we can't do that. Well, then get another engineer who says, well, that might be a bit of a challenge, but don't worry, I'm good at my job. Give me a couple of weeks. 
the new model has presented people like me that like modifying their vehicles and adding accessories and getting them just right and enhancing performance a couple of challenges actually a lot of challenges and not all of them are that obvious for example the radar system inside behind the rear vision mirror now means that Toyota's sun visor that I absolutely love because it keeps the temperature in the car so cool and reduces eye strain on hot bright days no longer available because I suspect it will interfere with that almost certainly will the uh, this guy this of course is a raised air intake not a snorkel it's not designed for deep water wading it's designed to pre-clean the air separate heavy dust particles from fine dust particles before they enter the airbox chamber designed for heavy dust environments while the kind of traveling i do it's dusty and there is a lot of dust but i would rather the performance upgrade that i will get by changing this into one with a probably ram air and a uh, the ability to tackle very deep water should i encounter it but none available now there will be i have to wait and wheel arch flares the back has not changed but the front well i actually don't know if it's changed it might have changed my guess is it has changed if you reckon everything in front of the b pillar is new and changed and not very many existing accessories will fit and behind it everything will fit and gone are the days where you can simply take a lead from your headlamps and run it to a relay to turn on your spotlights or light bar because the 70 series has entered the world of the modern automobile if you want to do that you have to use some kind of can bus signal and that you can't do in your workshop at home on the dashboard is a small lump you can see it there that is basically a light sensor so if i put my dash cover my lovely little pockets and everything that i love so much if i put it on the car the lights go out but if i pull it back the lights come on if those panel lights are off during the day with my sunglasses I see nothing it's black it's like the black hole of Calcutta so I have to keep that clear by pulling this back and that's annoying because I can't use my favorite dash cover my average fuel consumption at just under 500 kilometers is 10.4 liters per 100 kilometers. I reckon with the troop carrier that would be reading 12.4 liters per 100 kilometers. So that's promising. Troop carriers built for NGOs around the world are 11 seaters and are unique in that they can handle the extreme conditions faced by NGO fleets. It's only a five seater in this configuration and the people in the back will have, don't even have their own doors. So what is the troop carrier really good for? Certainly not for carrying people. The overlander that I will now build will be my fifth troopie. I've already built two in Africa and now this will be my third in Australia. These of course are my first impressions of the 2.8 troop carrier. I'm not going to take it off road in this video. Those videos to come. And of course the big question is, is it going to be better off road than the V8? And I can, uh, I can tell you that now. All right on sand it's going to be easier to drive because it's an automatic gearbox okay and even if you're a very inexperienced driver it will be good on sand because the automatic gearboxes on sand kind of generally hide mistakes to a large measure on lumpy climbs very very slow an automatic gearbox is even better than manual not many people know that because they don't know the techniques 
that you use to make them better. So if you're an inexperienced driver, you will find driving on those lumpy sections more difficult than with a manual. Using the right techniques, it's a game changer, like it is on sand. So much easier, it's unbelievable. And of course, when going down very, very steep slopes with an automatic, that's where you have a disadvantage. But this vehicle is fitted with a hill descent control. So a measure of that. There will never be quite as good as an, a manual on the extreme downhill slopes. But that electronic traction control is incredible. It's so effective that that apply with a little bit of braking and the lowest gear selected on the automatic box. They're very, very good performers, even in those conditions. And I will be explaining how I drive this vehicle with an automatic box, both in sand and on very rocky, slow climb work in videos to come. I am now very excited about the build that I have in front of me. Keep watching, of course, like and subscribe. See you in the next one.